I'm really grateful for the opportunity that's been extended to me to be able to be with you here this evening. I'm grateful for the people of this land and the care that they've taken of this place, the, the Klungan and the Songhees and the Wasanich people. I'm grateful for that beautiful prayer and introduction that we had this evening and how it fills our hearts with understanding and appreciation for uh, this place that we're on. It's so wonderful to be able to hear the language of this land and I acknowledge your good efforts to bring back what your parents and your, your four fathers and foremothers uh, spoke here. It's a really great accomplishment. And I'm also grateful to be able to have these beautiful songs sung as a part of uh, this introduction and to be able to feel in our hearts that heartbeat of Mother Earth and that connection to uh, our own mothers and that connection to the Earth that uh, keeps us strong. I'm also grateful that you're here and I'm thankful for the gifts that you bring to this place. I know that you have other things that you could be doing this evening and part of the honor that you're showing to these people and to the issue that we're involved here with this evening is demonstrated by your presence. I want to acknowledge that. I am grateful for that. And I feel the goodness that flows from that. I want to talk about this issue of direct action that was a part of our conversations in Canada over the last six months dealing with this issue uh, that was raised in the media and that you saw on the streets concerning Idle No More. Um, this notion that we won't be idle, that we will take action, and that action will be direct is an important part of the message that we heard as it went from coast to coast to coast. Uh, this idea of direct action is important to me because it communicates our agency that we have the ability to be able to respond, that we can make choices in what we do and how we act. And one of the things that I've learned as a law professor is that our laws flow from custom, from traditions, from practices. And I'm not just talking about Indigenous people's laws. When I teach in the Canadian Law School, in the US Law School, I'm quite aware that so much of what is done in the legislatures and done, is, and done in the court is just but a thin veneer. But that would crumble in a second were it not for the directness of our engagements, our customs, our traditions, our way of living. Sometimes, though, those customs and traditions can be troubling. And they can lead us to places that cause great damage and great harm. And part of what that damage was, was expressed to us in relationship to the residential school experience, was expressed to us in relationship to these lands, and the fact that they are no longer recognized as being rightfully in the possession of the initial owners and the continuing owners of this place. And so our customs sometimes can be troubling. Although we have indirect action, this ability to make a choice. <clears throat> that lies within our power. And I want to tell you a couple of stories that were important to me as I was growing up that helped to communicate this. And I hope in listening to these stories, you might think back to experiences that you've had that demonstrate to you the power that's present in human direct action. This first story developed when I was a young boy. I was about 10 years old, and we lived on a farm in southern Ontario, 150 acres. Uh, we had about a 12-acre hardwood bush, and we had these two beautiful barns, and I would go out to go up to that barn, and as I would walk in the doors, I would uh, suddenly see all the pigeons start to swirl through the air 
as the sun shone through those slats and the barn boards, and to just feel that celebration of life bursting out as I went into that sacred place. And so I would enjoy those moments, and then I would explore through the little bales of hay that were present throughout our barn, and I'd sometimes turn one over and I'd see a family of mice there. The little ones and the new growth that was a part of that. And I wouldn't have to go too much further, and between another set of bales would be the family of cats. <laughs> with all the kittens and all the life that was coming forth in that way. And it was a beautiful place to be able to grow up and experience all that uh, we've been given. One of my favorite parts of that uh, structure was an old chicken coop that was at the back of the barn. It was abandoned. And I found that there was a window there, and that window was a little bit higher than my young body was to be able to look out. So I would jump up and I would rest my belly on the windowsill, two stories up, and I would look out over the barnyard, and then I would see down the ravine, and then beyond the ravine there were the fields and then that hardwood bush. And that just filled me with such great amazement that I was alive and able to experience that as a young person. Well, one day as I was there with uh, that uh, feeling, I pushed myself off of the board, back onto the floor, and in so doing, I felt something in my foot. What I had done is I pushed myself up, landed on a board, on that board was a nail that was sticking straight up, and I remember looking down at my old North Star running shoes and thinking, what am I going to do now? And it was a struggle, and I had to pull that nail with the board out of my foot and then with great pain make my way back to the house where I sought the comfort of uh, my mother in particular and expecting that all would be made well I was surprised to be suddenly whisked off in the car and a few uh, minutes later uh, half an hour or so I found myself in the hospital staring had another needle <laughs> to be able to get a tetanus shot. So to make things worse, again, there was something of pain that was there. And I come home and I, I engage in that slow process of healing and there was no way I wanted to go back into that barn. And so for about three years, I left that place alone because it was a place of harm a place of uh, damage, a place where I was hurt, a place I did not want to be able to experience anymore. I still loved the rest of the farm though, and so I would go through the bushes and through the fields and through the ravine, and I can remember one day walking through the ravine, and up the side of the uh, hill was an old white pine tree. In Ontario, there's still some of these old um, beautiful trees that stand, and uh, it was something I was quite familiar with, but as I was walking by, I saw some motion at the bottom of the tree, and I looked more closely at what that was, and I recognized that a bird was there at the bottom, seeming to struggle, not able to be able to get out of that region that it was in. So again, I run back to the house, and I get my mother, and I said, come look, come see. And so she runs along uh, with me, and we go back to that place where the bird is. And wouldn't you know it, when my mother walks over to this bird, it was a red-tailed hawk, and she grabs it by the talons, holding the talons away from her, and then cradles its wings, and then pulling it close to her body, she takes it, uh, trying to cover its eyes, and she walks back to the, where the house is. In fact, she walked back to the barn. And there, in that old chicken coop, she placed that red-tailed hawk. Well, one of the first things that she did at that point was to examine, to look it over, to see what it was that might be wrong with it, and she couldn't tell. So she called on someone who might know. She called the representative of the Ministry of 
natural resources, and they came along, they looked uh, at this bird in the coop, and they said its wing is damaged, it's broken. Uh, this bird will not be able to survive. Um, so it's best if you put it out of its misery. At that time, they'd leave that to uh, people like uh, our family. And off he went. Well, my mother was going to have nothing to do with that. <laughs> And so uh, she looked uh, up with uh, the information that was available at that time and talked to people that she knew about what could be done to be able to help this bird come back to health. So with that knowledge that she had gained from her family and she gained from study, she took some of the mouse traps that were around and set them, and from time to time that bird was able to live on the mice that were in the barn. Uh, but most importantly, I think its mainstay in its diet was cat food. <laughs> and this uh, red-tailed hawk lived on cat food uh, for months and months at a time. Well, as you can imagine, with all of this commotion, I was attracted to what was happening there in the barn. And I can remember when that hawk was first placed in that uh, location, looking again through the slats and in the chicken coop, and just watching this majestic bird as it would uh, look back and forth at uh, what was in its surroundings. Eventually, I got a little bit braver, and I was able to enter that coop again. And in looking there, we would put the cat food uh, down very close to where the bird was, and again, it would look at us wouldn't take any action threatening or to hide, it was just paying attention. And through time, uh, it was such that I could freely go in that chicken coop. We noticed that this bird was getting better, and so we would start to place the food a bit further away from where it was roosted on the top of the old wire where the chickens used to sit. And eventually came the day, the chicken coop was probably here to that wall, maybe about this wide, where we put the food at the very other end of the chicken coop. Again, we'd come out, look back through the slats in the wall, and we'd see that bird jump up, and then it would soar, it would glide actually over to the chicken coop on the other side. This was a good sign. <coughs> and uh, with this, after a while, we thought that it was probably back to health. And so we wanted to get it outside, to get it back to where it could be free. And so one day we threw open the door to the chicken coop, and then we threw open the big barn doors that looked over another side of the barnyard and expected that the bird would leave. No such thing. The bird knew where that food was. <laughs> and so we had to devise and strategize again what would be necessary to be able to coax this bird to freedom. So, you know the story of Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> Putting the bits of food uh, through the chicken coop out to the door, from the door to the edge of the barn where the uh, threshold was to uh, the rest of the farm. And eventually, the bird followed that path until it stood on the threshold there. And I can remember my mother and I standing back uh, watching what was occurring here. And for a long time, that bird just sat. And uh, again, you know how they turn their heads very observantly. Uh, but eventually, a gust of wind came along. Again, it lifted up, put its wings out, and again glided, this time to the other side of the barnyard. And it perched on the old hand pump that was there near the well house. And to me, it looked as though that bird was looking back at us as we were there now in the threshold watching uh, what was occurring. I stood there, sat there for some time, until again another rush of wind came along. This time up it went, and then suddenly it caught an updraft and circling and circling and circling up until it was high above us. That was an amazing lesson for me about the possibilities that reside within us in thinking about healing 
and thinking about action that needs to be taken to be able to help us soar. As I think about uh, that time and that place, a part of it is recognizing that sometimes a place that can be one of great pain and great challenge can suddenly be transformed. But that suddenly takes a long time. Three years of not going there, and then months and months and months of watching this unfold. And in order for that to occur, I needed someone with knowledge. I needed someone to be able to show me what was possible. I needed my mother to be able to interpret for me and to take in this bird and show me about uh, this, uh, this other path forward. As I think about that experience, it was formative to me because I recognized in what my mother was teaching me the importance of Anishinaabek law. Because we can look at parliamentary rules and statutes and we can look at cases and from that we can draw standards and principles and reasons for judgment about what we should do when we're trying to make decisions. But as we heard about earlier, we have the rocks and the mountains and the birds and the animals as our legal textbooks. In their actions and in how we interact with them, we find principles for judgment, how to make decisions, how to be able to operate in this world in a good way. The Anishinaabe have a word for this way of teaching. It's called akinomage. Actually, a word for teaching is kikinomage. That's to teach. Kikinomage is to be able to guide someone in a direction uh, to follow. That's the word for teaching. Kikinomage. But this word I'm telling you about is akinomage. The word for earth in Anishinaabe Moen, Ojibwe or Chippewa, is <coughs> aki, a kid. This word akinomage means that the earth is the one that teaches you and guides you as to what your relationship should be. So learning from my mother that we could find a legal archive right outside our door opened my eyes to possibilities in taking more direct action as to what our responsibilities are as all people, including Anishinaabe people. So the years came and went, and I obviously went through public school and eventually through high school. I had an experience uh, where I went through university and eventually got my graduate degree and uh, found myself far away from home in Vancouver. Not the farm, not the reservation, not the bush, not the ravines. Wondering what I was doing there, feeling so homesick, feeling so disconnected, feeling that like this was not my place to be able to be. I knew that Vancouver was beautiful intellectually. I saw the mountains and the oceans, and I saw the greenery that was all around. I knew that here, but I didn't feel it in my heart. Fortunately, I had a good friend. His name is Alfred Scow, first a judge that was called to the bench in British Columbia, graduated in the 1960s. And uh, he paid his way through law school by fishing on trawlers uh, uh, as he was a young man. Well, Alfred Scow took me up with uh, one of my colleagues to his homeland, Muskawa Zawadeno. Um, so you go up north on Vancouver Island and then you take a float plane across from the island over to the mainland again, um, just uh, sort of at the top of the island but on the mainland. These uh, Kwakwio people um, received us into their communities as we were there. But as that invitation occurred, I had a dream just before I was to take off for this journey. In my dream, I was back home on the reservation, on the reserve, um, visiting with my family. I'd been away for quite some time. And so in this dream, I was looking forward to getting together with my mother and my aunt and family and enjoying the feast and just the welcome that's a part of that. 
After that, in the dream, we got into the car because they said, let's go down to see the lake. Let's go and take the beauty that's a part of that. And so off we go down to the lake, and we get out, and we're standing on the shore. And then suddenly it occurs to us that there's a pine tree on a small island just off the shore, perhaps about the length of this building or so. And we look up in that pine tree, and our eyes eventually see that there's a limb on that tree that's huge that's extending back towards the land. And as we look more closely, we see that there's a man in that pine tree, on that limb, with his hands in a nest. We didn't know quite what was going on there, uh, but we started to yell, come down over there, you're going to hurt yourself. You know, come back this way. You'll be safe here. And this person just looked at us, and as we were making a commotion, a couple of people started to gather along the shore, watching this uh, commotion that was occurring. As a few people gathered, and as we continued to try to entice him to come back, out of that nest he pulled a small baby eaglet, and he rested it on the side of the nest. And again, we kept trying to persuade him. We were now concerned about what he was going to do with that young life. And uh, the more we yelled, the more defiant he looked, until he took that little baby eaglet, and he brushed it off the side of the nest, it was too small to be able to fly, and down it went into the water below, and struggled, and we saw it go under. Well, at this point in my dream, I'm really concerned about what's happening, and so I thought, I'm gonna take some direct action here. I'm gonna do something about this. So I wade through that water that's knee-deep to that tree, and as I'm doing so, more yelling is occurring from me and my family that's gathered there. More people come and silently just stand around the shore, not seeming to do anything. I make my way up the tree, and as I'm doing so, he takes another baby eaglet, perches it on the side of the nest, and just as I'm about to reach him, same thing. Kicks that baby eaglet out, down it goes, and drowns in the waters below. I'm able to, at that point, to restrain this man. I somehow get him back across the limb. We make our way down the trunk. We come back from the island across the water to the shore. And by that time, much of our community is gathered there, silent, watching, not doing anything in relationship to what's transpiring here. In fact, as I walk to the shore, just as I'm about to the, the dry land, a police officer steps forward and says, I'm arresting you, pointing to me. I'm arresting you. I started to protest. Why? I'm trying to help you. Can't you see this man is damaging this eagle? He said, you are causing a disturbance here. You are disorderly. You are not keeping the peace. And again, I'm protesting about, well, can't you see that I'm trying to help here? This is an important thing to, you know, going on. I eventually said, I was here with my Auntie Norma this evening. I'm just trying to enjoy this evening. Oh, Auntie no Norma, he says. I know who Norma is. I heard that her nephew was coming over this evening and going to have dinner. You must be that person. Ah, I now know you are free to go. <laughs> and so through that, off I went, and I woke up. And I was left to reflect on what that dream might mean in significance for what I was experiencing. Another source of Anishinaabek law is actually found in our dreams. Uh, what we receive, what we think about while we're asleep, is to be interpreted is to be brought into our understanding, into our actions. So I had to think about that for a long time as I was going through the years, but also as I was taking this trip up to the Muskama Zawadeno people. As I was flying, as I was thinking, one of the things that occurred to me is sometimes in our attempts to be able to take action, many people just stand around the side silently and watch to see what it is that you're going to do. And there might be something appropriate and important in that, but there also could be a danger in that, as silent watchfulness doesn't engage us. And maybe, sometimes, I'm the person 
that's just standing on the sideline watching, not taking the kind of action that would be necessary to be able to remedy some of the situations that are around. One lesson that was there. Another lesson that was there was in relationship to that police officer. I realized that, to some extent, law is relative. <laughs> Meaning that there is a customary, there's a relational element. Until people know who you are, and you establish some sense of connection and credibility, you can't really do much in taking uh, direct action. And that caused me to reflect that I was now in a new place in British Columbia, and that yes, my community is the Chippewa of the Nawash First Nation, but I have other people that I can now relate to. And it's important to be involved and to let people into my life and invite people into the circles that we are in. And I recognize that when that happens, we can take better direct action. But there was another message there, it was a little bit more troubling, which has to do with, am I sometimes myself in what I teach, what I write, what I get involved with, sometimes the man in the nest? By what I say, do, write, might I be? precariously casting away the life and the future that's here. There's a self-reflexivity that's needed in taking action. It has to be taken in conjunction with the community. You can't just be that solitary person sitting in that nest. So with this as a background, I get on this flight from the Vancouver airport over to Campbell River, from Campbell River on the airplane across to the mainland, a float plane, land in an uh, estuary, we get out of the float plane into a boat, so we take about a 30 minute ride up a river, we get out of the river, we get into a truck, uh, take another 10 minute ride, out of the truck, across the river, finally we're standing in the Kinkam Inlet, in this uh, beautiful territory. And there we're hosted for four days, uh, Ernie Sandy, was our host as we were present in that location. And Ernie was the most gracious host that you want to meet. Um, he said, whenever the tide went out, there our table was set with all of the beautiful shellfish and the seafood that was present there. And so we feasted on clam fritters and scallops and um, uh, seafood. It was just incredible. At the end of our journey there, he took me into the big house. And it was a structure maybe half of the size of this room. And it had an old dirt floor, and there were benches all around the side, and there was a screen at the end, and behind the screen were some areas for preparations for their ceremonies. But what he did as we were there is he took me to the four corners of this room. And he talked to me about what was engraven on those posts. And he told me a story of their people and their ancestors that was as old as the valley that we were standing in. And as we came through the post, we eventually got to the last one. And there, on that post, someone had taken an, an axe and defaced a lot of the images. And with a note of sadness in his voice, he said something like, this is what our people did in the day of our sadness. We turned away from that which would help us remember who we are, would help us remember our connection to this place. This post stands as a symbol that we will remember and never, never more forget. And with that, we came out of the big house, and we stood in that valley, and there were two beautiful eagles that were soaring over the valley. And I've been taught that when you grow, that those eagles are the grandmothers and the grandfathers that watch over us. Right? What a contrast to that baby eaglet being drowned, that in fact we can see that uh, we, can, we, can, we can soar. And so these messages about direct action were an important part of my thinking in Developing an understanding that law is us. 
and it's the animals, and it's our dreams, and it's our stories, and it's our relationships. It's the way we talk with one another and try to persuade one another. And that persuasion, of course, involves many different traditions now. But that persuasion is a part of our law. And it's not just for the parliaments, and it's not just for the courts. We have a role in taking that kind of action. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to speak to you at the start of this conference to have us thinking about singing a new song, because in those songs are embedded many of those teachings. And I just want to briefly uh, sing you a song I have recently learned that tells of these connections. It does so in relationship to um, a spirit, a spirit bear, Manidu Makwa, and in this song, I will refer to the spirit. The person that received this song is uh, the chair of the Indian Residential Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Chief uh, uh, or Justice Murray Sinclair. Um, Murray is not well right now. He's not able to travel because he has thoughts that prevent him from flying. Um, but he has that spirit of that bear. He learns so many things that come from that, and I'm grateful for people like him that are taking his kind of action. There's many ways that that action can flow. So I will sing this song, and then when I finish, I will sit down and turn the time over to my friend Glenn. <laughs> 